Good morning. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Board of Water and Power Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, October 11th, 2022. This proceeding is being broadcast on Channel 35. The exact broadcast times can be found by contacting Channel 35. Board of Water and Power Commissioners, please stay present for roll call. Commissioner Larer? Here. President McLean Hill? Commissioner Neiman Brady? Present. Vice President Ruiz? Present. Three board members, a quorum is present. Madam Vice President? Thank you so much. And our President McLean Hill will be in shortly. For now, let's go ahead and get started. In our first order of business this morning are our public comments. Do we have any general public comments this morning? Yes, Vice President, we have five. Let's please open public comment. Good morning, speakers. Please be mindful that you will have two minutes for public comment. The first speaker will be Ann Kim, who will then be followed by Dominique Eastman. Good morning. Hi, I'm actually, since this mask is optional, I can see your faces and you can see mine. Um, I'm Ann Kim with AIDS Healthcare Foundation. I feel like I've seen each one of you a few times now. Um, as you know, um, we operate the Healthy Housing Foundation. We have 1,200 units that were um, of affordable housing that we're providing for, um, for our tenants at an average rent of $550 um, per unit at maybe about 200 square feet a unit. Um, and we're paying um, almost $100, um, somewhere between $80 and $100 a month in um, water and power for each of these units. Um, and it's, you know, it's unsustainable. Those dollars need to be um, used to, to provide more units. So we really do want to um, work with you to be able to do more good, to provide more affordable housing for the tenants in Los Angeles. Um, we're waiting for that call from Mr. Adams, um, as indicated at the last meeting. I'm ready for your call. I'm ready to have that meeting. I'm ready to work together. So. Please, um, please reach out to us. Um, we can, we can really do a lot of good if we work together. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The next speaker is Dominique Eastman, who will be followed by Jasmine Vargas. Hello, all. Uh, I'm Dominique Eastman. I work with AIDS Healthcare Foundation as well. I'm actually the operations manager for the Healthy Housing Foundation. And just to, to double down on what uh, Ms. Kim just said, that uh, a lot of our units cost $400. And to be paying $100 in utility for a 200 square foot unit um, is, is kind of high cost. Uh, AHF stepped in to try to provide as much affordable housing as we can. And what's unique about us is that we don't have any subsidized units. So that means everything is coming out of pocket. Um, and we rob Peter to pay Paul, basically. So some buildings are operate at a loss. Some buildings are uh, profitable. But we share an income stream between each property. And um, our, our, our residents deserve it. We will never um, use what, what we pay in utilities to charge the residents because they simply can't afford it and we wouldn't want them to. So we just ask if you could please, you know, work with us, help us out, and um, maybe we could come to some kind of a agreement or arrangement to, um, to lower some of our costs on the back end so we can continue to buy more buildings as um, that's what our goal is and that's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Jasmine Vargas, who will be followed by Ashkor Tulukdar. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Jasmine Vargas. I'm with Wood and Water Watch, a longtime organizer in the city of Los Angeles, and you've seen me here before. In fact, I'm here in this picture, if you would like to know. I was part of the LA 100 advisory group, um, and uh, I want to share today that I'm really dismayed um, very, I feel very tokenized, and I feel like 
the work that has been done around equity, around energy justice in this, in this chamber has not met the expectations that myself and the communities in LA that have been calling for 100% clean energy in this city have expected. Um, I wanted to share a little bit about my experience, but I know I don't have much time. I wanna spend more time speaking about the management report that you will be hearing from LADWP on the SLTRP 2022, because that directly is impacting how we're going to meet that 100% clean energy future. Um, when I was in these meetings, I consistently called out the lack of environmental justice and low-income community representation in this group enough to that Cynthia McLean Hill actually called for an LA Equity Strategies Committee. So we know there's been a problem. So why are we moving forward with an SLTRP without even completing the LA Equity Strategies work? Why are we moving forward without answering the critical questions of like, where will the water come? come from for the hydrogen? Or what kind of infrastructure are we gonna need? Will it be safe? Will it keep us reliant on fossil fuels? All these questions have not been answered. And frankly, uh, I think that this committee has the right and should take up the responsibility of leading on the SLTRP. What that means is actually bringing up to the vote at this board, a vote that can ultimately be the voice of the people. and uh, and. I've heard directly from LADWP's mouth that it is not going to be the case. So in, in conclusion, I also want to say that because of this, because of no SLTRP vote, because of no LA equity strategies, I recommend you resend your approval of the scatter good hydrogen modernization project that you sent to the city council a uh, month back. Um, that's the least you can do. Thank you so much. Thank you, next speaker. Ashkur Tulukdar, who will be followed by Francis Yang. Good morning. Commissioners, good morning. Um, I feel like we're getting to know each other very well. Um, I uh, don't really have a whole lot more to add factually to what my colleagues have already said. I mentioned last time I was here that uh, Los Angeles faces an extraordinary crisis in homelessness. It's an exponentially growing crisis. And AIDS Healthcare Foundation has stepped in for the last five years to help solve that crisis. 1,200, 1200 families might seem a small number. To us, it seems a very large number, given that we've only been in this for, for about five years. What we are looking for and asking for and requesting from LADWP is a sustained long-term partnership to provide a solution to the utility needs of these residents. I mentioned last time, we are not interested in billing them and individually metering them. They, as it stands, have a very hard time paying the meager amount of rent that we charge them. It would just be catastrophic to them if we started charging utilities or metering their utilities. So we intend on paying for those utilities out of our own pocket. As my colleague Dominique said, we don't have any subsidies and support from anybody else. It is just our own funds and we are obligated to be good stewards of those funds. And we believe that good stewardship means that we need to appeal to folks like yourself, this board, other departments of the city to work together with us so that we can provide the solution in a sustainable long-term way because we don't want to see the encampments coming up at every street corner uh, in, in the community here, in the communities where we live, because those are also citizens of LA and they deserve better. So uh, I will again appeal to President McLean Hill's uh, commitment last time to find a solution. Uh, I appreciate the acknowledgement that you do have plans for low income uh, clients, but they're all plans for individuals. There actually exists no plan for a corporate uh, uh, entity that is paying the utility bill. So I really do hope that we can come up with a plan very soon. And like my colleague Ann said, we are ready and waiting to work with you. Uh, we just are waiting for you to reach out to us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Public comment is now closed. Okay, we have completed our public comment. Wait, wait. shouldn't I have this? Thing? I'm sorry. We did you, did you file for You called his name. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. Francis Yang, please open public comment again. Public comment is now open. Sorry. We apologize, Francis, for that oversight. Totally fine. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you too. 
Um, good morning, my name is Francis. I'm an organizer for the Sierra Coast My Generation campaign. I've spoken to this board a number of times now. Um, this has been a pretty interesting week. Our city is feeling very fragile at this moment in communities across LA and larger are deeply concerned about how our city is working. The Scattergood Project and this SLTRP is one of them. Energy advocates have been deeply concerned and worried that Scattergood and the, the other power plants' plans for retrofitting to green hydrogen does not have sufficient oversight to pivot away from a project that could very well perpetuate environmental racism. We have been working hard to try to address these issues with DWP staff, with this board, to ensure that questions like, how are we actually going to be moving away from a system that continues to pollute and harm communities, especially low-income communities of color? How are we going to address these kinds of issues? And frankly, back in 2017, when the mayor announced that we're gonna get rid of these power plants, that was a big signal to us, like we were actually <coughs> making those moves to stand by those commitments, that those values can be actionable into real projects. But throughout this SLTRP process, communities across LA have been feeling like, no, we're not actually serious about that command. We're not actually serious about upholding those values. Instead, we are still committed to pipelines, combustion, damages to public health and land use. And so for us to ask now, how is the city working and how are we doing our best to ensure mm -hmm. equity and safety for our communities? The Scattergood Project is not feeling like we're on the right track. And so we must do our best to protect communities by avoiding these kinds of massive, massive projects. We need to invest and continue to uphold transparency to make sure that the health impacts for our most vulnerable are actually taken care of. So once we move forward with this, we are locked in for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Public comment is now closed. Okay, let's move on to item number D, which is report by our general manager. Thank you very much and good morning. It's great to see everyone today and and, uh, and see more of everyone today. We have a, our first meeting since the uh, mayor lifted the mask mandate in city buildings. So now we will let our employees make their own decisions about whether they want to wear a mask or not at work. And, uh, and so it's... Uh, change in the workplace and I think we're making some progress. Um, I want to let me just say that I did see the video that you did uh, sent out to the employees and I thought about around this issue and I thought it was an excellent video. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you know, along those lines, just to comment real quickly, um, you know, a number of folks will still continue to wear masks for a variety of perfectly valid reasons, their own personal choice worried about family members and other things. And so one of the things we want to make sure is that all employees, you know, respect everyone's rights to make that decision for themselves and and also to continue to, you know, be smart, uh, keep distance and that sort of thing. So we know that the, the uh, pandemic is not necessarily over. COVID certainly is not going away. Uh, and I think we can continue to, to move forward and, and be careful at the same time. Because so. now we have the flu season. That's, well, I think the, I, I think the mask... <laughs> helped a lot with flu season last year, so who knows? We might all elect to wear them more often than we did before <laughs> for that and, reason. And Marty, some city agencies still are required to wear, wear masks, correct? Uh, well, the, the, what happened is the, uh, the city of LA in city buildings had a mask requirement, so the mayor lifted that. Okay. So, um, so it's in any city building, it's up to personal choice now, yeah. Okay. So I, I'm not aware of any other agency that requires it, except for um, in a homeless uh, setting or a medical setting, their masks are required. Yes. And I, and I believe the um, Julie's agency also. Uh, that could be. That yeah. Could be yeah. 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 So, yeah. So anyway, so there's certain requirements, and those are coming from the Department of Health Services of the county. Yeah. Um, I want to announce our, our Cool LA uh, initiatives off to a very good start. Um, uh, I have to give Joe Romala credit for saying a very hot start. Kind of counteracts cool initiative. Thank you, Joe. Um, so, you know, in all of 21, 22, we did only 283 regular $75 rebates. In the last three weeks, we've more than doubled that. So we've had 497 customers purchase a total of 606 room air conditioners and receive the $225 rebate. So, um, which means that there's 497 families now who previously would suffer during hot times who are, uh, have the ability to be much more comfortable. And so, those, are, those were the instant rebates. And these are the instant re Well, initially the first few days you had to do the outlay and they got a rebate. And then within a few days after launching, we had the, the rebate at point of sale up and, up and running for the online marketplace. 
And so that is that is correct. Now, people can get the rebate as they purchase the unit. And so it's uh, been great success. So we've moved about $136,000 um, uh, in rebates uh, to, to Angelinos who qualify for that. And, and we continue to get additional rebates for the regular $75 rebates as well. So that's been a great success since the launch of that program. Uh, we also launched uh, on the 29th of September the Flume program. And uh, Commissioner Lair was there uh, with the mayor and myself uh, launching the Flume program. That was where it's a... A uh, meter that electronic meter that that straps on attaches to regular water meter and gives the the homeowner instant. Uh, information about their water use. And so um, that was very successful. Um, that, that's a normally a $199 unit that we have provided a rebate and a cost reduction to the manufacturer. So uh, uh, an eligible, uh, actually any any resident in the city of LA, uh, a, a residential customer can go online, pay $49 up front plus shipping and handling. As soon as they sign up, $25 of that's credited back to their account. So at the end of the day, it's $24 plus shipping and handling. I am uh, your test case. Case, Marty. I've ordered oh, mine, uh, so when I receive it, I will let you know, and I'll let you know when I get rid of my rebate. I, I will tell you, I, I had <laughs> comments from a number of other city managers who ordered them and, and put them on right away. So, yeah, I'm interested. Yeah, I understand the rebate is there in seconds from the time you hook it up. So, anyway, I think we're that'll give us the first real look at real-time water monitoring, and I think it'll help our customers a lot besides finding things such as leaks. And also uh, the homeowner who uh, hosted us for the event uh, commented how much she learned about how much water was being used by, you know, teenager in the showers and all sorts of things like that. Yeah. It's kind of eye-opening how much water does get used. People don't believe they can use that many without gallons of water in a day, but it's, it's quite possible. Um, we've also increased our turf rebate from $3 to $5 a square foot to continue to remove uh, more turf throughout the city. Um, I think uh, we're going to talk later on about Colorado River supply, and we know that with uh, with what the state's facing for water supply, I think um, you know continuing to change out and, and push the change out of, lands of outdoor landscapes to be more California-friendly is going to be a critical tool uh, moving forward. Uh, lastly, I just want to note that we have a lot of observations this October. Uh, yesterday was Indigenous Peoples Day, and I know our board president, uh, Cynthia Ruiz, was there. And, I'm a vice uh, president. Uh, pardon me, vice president. <laughs> I, sorry. I, <laughs> Excellent yes, promotion. So, <laughs> the, yeah, sorry. Um, was there, and uh, thank you for representing us. Uh, we do have, um, uh, as we know, a number of, uh, of tribal engagements through our work, particularly in the Owens Valley at the department. And so, certainly, um, you know, honoring the the uh, history and the contributions of Native Americans and the tribal nations is very important to us. Uh, October is also Filipino American History Month. And we have more than 600 uh, uh, employees of Filipino descent here at the department. And so we have events coming up this month um, in celebration with them. Uh, the first week of October was also Public Power Week as well as, as well as Customer Service Week. And then we also hosted a Clean Air Day celebration, uh, which was last Wednesday. Um, and we had a, a number of folks who, uh, who attended an event in the parking lot. We shared that event with, uh, with the other organizations, uh, LA SAN, Metrolink, uh, Northeast Trees, and City Plants were all part of that celebration. And then coming up in October is our Cybersecurity Awareness Month. And this, um, if, if there's ever time to be cybersecurity aware, it's right now. Um, we saw what happened with the airports over the weekend. I know um, Mark Northrop for our IT has been, you know, constantly defending the department and our network. And I think that we largely see that we're that we're being challenged all the time on that front. So it's a very important month for us to make sure our employees are very aware and receive all the training they need to make sure that we're as secure as we possibly can. And, Lastly, back, and back to sorry. the Public Power mm -hmm. Week. Yes. I just, again, I want to say it was an excellent video that was put out of, you know, talking about the different employees. And um, I think that, it, you know, we're doing a re really good job when it comes to that. Thank you. And I'd actually like to share that video if we could um, I, with everyone. It's, uh, it's about employees for customer service and uh, how they see their roles in customer service serving the public. As a customer service representative, I travel between our 14 customer service centers to handle in-person customer requests for a variety of LEBWP services. I'm Derek Leong, and I supervise the Water Quality Customer Service Squad, where we assist our customers with their water quality inquiries and conduct on-site water quality checks. I'm Christopher Rivers. 
I support our employees by providing training to customer service representatives and new hires so that we can efficiently support our customers. I'm Martha Rodriguez and I educate customers to support our water <coughs> conservation efforts and assist them in taking advantage of our water conservation rebates to save money. I also assist in filling our customer requests for free water conservation devices. I'm Caitlin So, and I provide guidance to employees on COVID-19 related issues to help keep the workplace safe and employees healthy so that we can seamlessly serve our customers. We are LADWP. Thank you, and thank you to our thank you to our uh, folks in uh, in public relations who did a great job in the video. So, and that's conclusion of my report. Uh, yes, can I have a question? Uh, just given today that some other presentations about you know basically buildings that might have you know ten units or more, Flume is very effective, and uh, I I wonder if if there is a you know a device out there that's going to be able to handle more than you know. It seems like made for single family homes. So wherever those young people were from Cal Poly, uh, San Luis Obispo, who are the ones who actually created this device, I was really impressed. Um, you know, it'd be interesting if you haven't already to find out if um, they could be sort of, if there could be a unit, a device that actually can monitor 10 or 20 units so that uh, people from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation and others could track and say, hey, you know, may maybe there is a leak over there. Um, or maybe, like we discovered, that showers, you can, taking a shower, you can use up to 80 to 100 gallons of water if you take a nice long shower. So how do you manage that? So just making sure that we're, we're helping everybody understand and get their perspective on, on this issue. So does yeah, that we can look into that, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, you're right, the flume is more geared towards single yeah. meters, so we can certainly take a look and see if there's any other options out there available. Yeah. Just make yeah. it a challenge to the students. The They'll student. come up with something, I'm sure. <laughs> very creative, yes. <laughs> Okay, um, Mr. Adams, is that complete item number D? That does, thank you very much. Okay, let's move on to item number E, introduction of motions for future consideration. Commissioners, are there any motions you'd like to consider? Not at this time, thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and go to comments from the ratepayer advocate. Good morning. Good morning. Um, We'll have uh, comments on item J1, which is about the SLTRP, and we support um, items uh, M2, uh, M6, uh, M7, uh, and uh, we'll have other comments as necessary. Thank you. Okay, let's go ahead and go to item number G, which is discussion with neighborhood councils representatives. Do we have any comments from neighborhood councils? Yes, Madam Vice President. One community impact statement was received from the Woodland Hills Warner Center Neighborhood Council. No representatives from this council were here to speak. This community impact statement has been published on LADWP.com for public record and was included in the commissioner's briefing materials. Thank you so much for that. Let's go on to item number H, which is comments from our Inspector General. And this was a presentation that was deferred from our last meeting. So good morning, Inspector General. Good morning, Vice President Ruiz. Uh, good morning, members of the board. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to address you today as the inaugural Inspector General for the LADWP. Uh, it's an honor, um, not only because I'll be providing you with an update on the work that my team has been doing since my arrival in May, uh, but because this is the first step into baking transparency into my team from the ground up. I want to ensure that the Office of the Inspector General does its work in a transparent way, and in many ways that will secure its effectiveness going forward. Um, at its core, my team's job is to ensure that the fine, honest work 
that gets carried out at the LADWP is what shines every single time somebody thinks about this essential agency. And the LADWP is as essential as it comes. It's at the core provides necessary lifeline services to every Angelino, and I count myself among those. Um, as I walk through the history of the LADWP's OIG, current fraud, waste, and abuse practices here at the agency, and plans for my team, I wanna invite you to ask questions, raise concerns. Um, don't feel like you've gotta hold them until the end of the presentation. This is what I'll be covering here today. As I mentioned, not only the history of my position, um, but a run through of the current fraud, waste, and abuse practices at the agency, uh, how those current practices inform the mission and operational philosophy of the team that I am building, and the functions and structure of that team. I'll also highlight critical next steps in not only the building of the team, but, but current work of the office. Uh, the Office of the Inspector General was created following a federal investigation that uncovered criminal fraud by former LADWP senior management and other individuals. I highlight that because my presence in many ways triggers that trauma again for LADWP staff, managers, and stakeholders. And I stress to folks that I'm not here to find individual wrongdoer, wrongdoers. I'm here to create the necessary systems with the support of the board and, and other senior management at the LADWP so we can avoid those situations in the future. And I hope that you see that thread, that preventative angle shine through uh, what we'll be discussing here today. Uh, since May, my team has continued fraud, waste, and abuse work while working to understand the needs of the agencies, the agency. That has included focused outreach to stakeholders. And I wanna thank each of the stakeholders who has sat down with me and members of my team to help us understand the needs of the agency. That includes organized labor representatives. It includes e each of the senior managers here at the table today uh, in, in the audience. Um, it has also helped me understand um, what the agency really needs. Uh, the current fraud, waste, and abuse practices, to be blunt, uh, leave a lot to be desired. The work is not preventative. It is complaint-driven, and tailored ethics advice and tra training resources are underdeveloped or non-existent. The majority of fraud, waste, and abuse complaints regarding the LADWP are currently received as referrals from the controller's office fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. That's a hotline that's available citywide, and that serves as a one-stop shop for LA city government as a whole. Um, once those complaints are received there, they're referred to the ethics team here at LADWP, but because that ethics team lacks investigators or individual tailored resources to address those complaints, they more often than not get formed out to the system at issue. That means if somebody has reached out to the city controller and said there's a contract coming out of one of the systems that I think smells a little funny, uh, it, it often goes right back to that system. And that raises serious concerns on the integrity front. Uh, sometimes they are referred to outside counsel for investigation, but the, those are a very small amount of those fraud, waste, and abuse complaints. So Sergio, I'm a data person. So just do we have any kind of numbers? How many how many referrals have we gotten from the controller's office? We do, and I can make sure that uh, Vice President, you and the board get them. Um, the COVID pandemic has had an impact mm -hmm. on the number of fraud, waste, and abuse complaints um, citywide. Um, I do believe in that- In a positive way or a negative way? Uh, it likely in a way that minimizes the number of complaints that, that would have been filed. Um, Folks are working now in more atomized settings, and that makes it more difficult for them to understand how their teams are operating. And sometimes that means there are less eyes on particular processes. Um, and so we're losing out in many ways um, in that remote setting. Um, I'll discuss um, in short order uh, the treatment of those complaints when they do come at the LADWP and how the LADWP stacks up, so to speak, with other city agencies. Conversations with staff and stakeholders do reveal frustrations with current fraud, waste, and abuse practices here at the agency. Folks have been very frank with me about their dissatisfaction 
with ethics related support, a lack of, uh, with an emphasis on a lack of tailored ethics compliance training. The LADWP is so unique. Its work is so different than any other city agency. Um, but all that we essentially have are the citywide fraud, waste, and abuse trainings. Um, there's also a fear of retaliation. Mm -hmm. Folks have stressed to me that sometimes they feel like they should file a complaint, but they're afraid of what will happen once they do. Um, and in many ways, that life cycle of fraud, waste, and abuse complaints that I described earlier amplifies those concerns, right? Someone might decide to file a complaint and find that it is being investigated by somebody on the team that they are a part of, as opposed to a separate centralized body. And so I think that is inhibiting, in many ways, certain fraud, waste, and abuse complaints. There's a generalized distrust in fraud, waste, and abuse processes, including perceptions of bias in the investigation and the resolution of complaints, which ties into point number two also. And finally, there's a lack of timeliness in complaint resolution. Um, folks stressed to me that they felt like these investigations, they would take too long. And sometimes they wouldn't get any updates about what had happened. Each of these is difficult to test out. Right? These are perceptions, um, and it's hard to quantify them, with the exception of point number four, which is where working with the city controller's office, I was able to obtain um, relevant data that helps highlight the, the, that timeliness concern. And what that data does show is that LADWP does spend more than double the time to assess, investigate, and close complaints from the controller when compared to other city agencies. I wanted to make sure that we were doing an apples to apples comparison there. As I mentioned, the LADWP is a unique agency. I also wanted to make sure that we were dealing with data that didn't suffer from the warping effect of the COVID pandemic, which is why you see 2018 and 2019, as opposed to more recent years. I think that as the city opens up, as the workplace returns to more normalcy, um, you're likely to see that pattern repeat unless we make some changes. Uh, based on a review of the judgmental sample of the referred matters, I don't think the lag time can be explained by a general type or complexity of the complaint. I think this is a product of the decentralized management and investigation of complaints. Um, and it's also, it also speaks to a lack of sufficiently large investigation staff within the agency to effectively review in a timely fashion the allegations that are coming down the pipeline. Okay. So, uh, Inspector General, so I'm looking at the bar graph. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, it's by year, and then the left, is that the number of days that it takes? The blue column is the average number of days that it took in that particular year uh, to re following receipt of a complaint to close it out, meaning to complete the investigation. So in 2019, it took more than a year? It took, on average, more than a year to uh, fully investigate a complaint. That's right. Wow. And all of this, along with the concerns that I heard from stakeholders, is what has informed the plans for the office. I think, um, Vice President, we want to shorten these times um, because in many ways, each of these complaints can serve to create a cloud on an individual, right? These are suspicions. These aren't um, allegations that have been confirmed. And I wanna stress, right, in my work in this space in public integrity and other positions, most complaints get closed out as unfounded because there's been a misunderstanding. Uh, but if you drag that investigation out, what you're really doing is injuring careers because there are whispers uh, once those complaints are filed, and you're injuring the integrity of the agency as a whole, its reputation. So what you really wanna do is close these out as soon as possible. 60 days is the gold standard. I think we can get there with sufficient resources and a change in approach. And that's what figures into the proposed functions for the Office of the Inspector General and what we're gonna be building towards over the next year. The three primary duties of the, of the office, which will serve as a one-stop shop for preventing and addressing fraud, waste, and abuse, is to have three distinct teams and functions with, within the office. The first is complaints and outreach. Uh, 
We don't want to wait on the city controller to receive a complaint, go through its processes and then provide them to us. We wanna build that function in-house to make sure that we're shortening that amount of time and keeping the agency on top of um, certain issues that might be revealed by those complaints. To do that, you have to build a welcome mat, so to speak, that inspires confidence and cuts through some of the concerns that I highlighted previously, concerns about retaliation, timeliness, and, and fairness. You also want a centralized investigations and audits team. These are the professional investigators and forensic audit staff who are gonna receive the necessary training to investigate these complaints so that they aren't farmed out to the system at issue. That's gonna be great for the power system and the water system because their staff will be better able through increased capacity to carry out their routine duties, not chasing down fraud, waste, and abuse allegations. It's also gonna shorten time because we're gonna have dedicated staff taking a look at those. And finally, and just as importantly, ethics, compliance, and performance. These are the staff that are gonna create for us the tailored ethics training and advice and compliance services so that we have something that is tailor-made for the LADWP and the unique situations that arise here. So I'll walk you through in greater detail those teams and also highlight for you on this slide, um, apologies, there is entirely too much uh, text here, um, the particular mission of the Office of the Inspector General and the values that will drive it. Um, we're gonna focus on addressing fraud, waste, and abuse through the centralized receipt and independent investigation of complaints. We're gonna provide the tailored ethics training, advice, and compliance support that I mentioned previously. Also work to routinely assess systemic policies and practices to ensure the LADWP's work is efficient and effective and creating a path of least resistance so that we'll, folks are doing their work with integrity and honesty in mind. And we're gonna do all that with, by increasing transparency in the way our team functions through regular and special public reports. How is the mission developed? The mission was developed um, in conversations with my team, uh, taking a look at other similarly situated oversight bodies, both in this space and outside of it. Um, there were only two inspector generals at the city of Los Angeles, myself and uh, Inspector General Mark Smith of the LAPD, but there are inspector generals at the county level in other cities and other counties in California and, and throughout the country. So taking a look at that, synthesizing it with what we were hearing from staff, what we were learning from the information that we gathered about the specific needs of the, of the LADWP, that was all, uh, that all went into the recipe, so to speak, of, of this mission. Okay, and did you, um, it, it doesn't sound like it, but uh, the various part, other entities in, within LADWP did not get a chance to weigh in. Yes, uh, the, uh, I sat down with each of the senior managers and any staff that reached out to me and, and that frankly I uh, pinned down in hallways and in elevators. Um, uh, I should have highlighted this, um, senior management and staff and external stakeholders received an abbreviated version of this presentation so that they could opine and provide me with their uh, input, advice, concerns, and, and the work was better for it. Okay, it doesn't go as far to say that you have all the senior leadership support uh, for the mission, but they have had a chance to opine on it. Oh, uh, they have had a chance to opine on senior management, um, including um, the folks here and across the way, um, were incredibly positive and supportive. Um, in many ways, I think uh, to the folks who have lived in this agency for years and decades, none of this was a surprise. I think that there are certain organizational directives at the LADWP which take center stage, um, and, and it's obvious why they take center stage. Power's gotta flow, water's gotta flow. But integrity in many ways needs to sit alongside those concerns, and folks were incredibly positive and supportive, and, and that has continued um, to Good. be the and, case. And that was, that was definitely my expectation. Yes. My, well, more what I was getting at, not that you wouldn't find the buy-in with the LAD leadership, but yeah. that um, if you, d you, you, need, you need to work together. So I wanted yes. to ensure that that was indeed happening. So. No, and, and I appreciate it, and I do mean it when I, um, 
focus on transparency and accountability. I will be an honest communi communicator with the board about those issues, with the general public, just like I am an honest communicator with the general manager and, and senior management. Mm -hmm. um, it's not about gotcha and surprises. It's about always um, leading with that, which is communication and transparency. And so I appreciate that um, opening that door, Commissioner. So we will focus, and this is a prime concern and, and something that, that, that folks have led with me in their frank conversations on independence. Uh, the inspector general in this office is situated within the agency. I think that is a good thing. Um, it means more ready access, support, and buy-in, like what we were just discussing. But it means that we have to be clear about the fact that we move independently. And the general manager has been a key supporter on that issue at every step of the way. Uh, we'll be transparent in our work and we ourselves will be accountable to um, metric, metrics for success, right? Um, the OIG has to practice what it preaches and its work needs to be um, open to criticism. And I welcome your constant feedback and the feedback of all stakeholders on that. Our work also needs to be carried out with integrity, um, not only with an emphasis on confidentiality, but on carrying out investigations, audits, reviews, in keeping with best practices. And we have to be responsive to the needs of the community, various stakeholders, senior leadership, staff, everybody. Um, and that's why you see um, on the next slide that emphasis on that top, top team, not only complaints, but also outreach. Uh, we will have staff that will help us keep in touch with members of the, the stakeholder community. Um, and that's what I describe in greater detail here. We're gonna be uh, uh, an open door on the complaints front, meaning we're building out a toll-free hotline, um, both written, electronic, and mail complaint processes, walk-ins, um, and phone, uh, all of the above. It doesn't matter how people want to file a complaint with us, anonymous or not anonymous, we will take it and we'll give it a fair shake. We'll also have dedicated staff to uh, manage necessary relationships with internal and external stakeholders, including but not limited uh, folks within the LADWP building, city regulatory bodies like the Controller's Office and the Ethics Commission, law enforcement agencies, and members of the community. There are gonna be some complaints that come through the door that my team is not well suited to investigate. And we'll wanna make sure that those go to the bodies that do have the necessary tools, resources, and focus to give it a fair shake. And so that's where those necessary relationships are gonna be key. The investigations and audits team, which is gonna live within the office of the inspector general uh, unit will receive the bulk of the complaints that come in the door, and we'll be focused on investigating them in a timely, objective, and directed fashion. Well, we're also gonna have a forensics audit unit, which is different than the internal audit team that already exists at the LADWP, because its work will be complaint-driven, and the, the staff on this team will be properly trained to identify both individual misconduct and systemic issues that may make misconduct more likely. And uh, I think this team is what's really going to pay off for the LADWP in, in many different ways. I don't need to tell you all this, but so much money flows in and out of the agency. And uh, we need um, a dedicated staff to help us monitor that um, in a timely fashion. Um, we don't wanna wait six months to a year to find out we've got an issue. We wanna hit that 60 day target. And again, last but not least, the ethics compliance and performance team. These are the team, these two teams actually already exist at the LADWP, although they'll be getting further staffed up, especially in the ethics compliance unit. Our ethics compliance unit is gonna develop um, the tailored training that I've emphasized uh, previously. Also going to develop a specific advice line for LADWP staff and stakeholders so that when they've got a question before they act, they can pick up the phone and speak directly to, to a real life person and say, hey, I'm thinking about going to this conference and a sponsor wants to pay for it. What are the issues that I need to think about? One, does the law allow it? Even though it does allow it, what are the perception issues that I need to be on top of? That's where the necessary preventive work 
is really gonna pay off because if the ethics compliance team is doing its work, we get less complaints. Um, and if we do get a complaint, we can say, well, you know, Commissioner X, uh, Senior General Manager Y, they reached out, we flagged for them the concerns, we know they did it right, and we can close it out quickly. Uh, and so this is a key part of the puzzle. Um, and finally, inform and manage compliance with the existing conflict of interest code and ensure that when that is up for a refresh, we can do that in a timely and effective fashion. Uh, the corporate performance unit, which already exists, as I mentioned here at the LADWP, that's our systems focus, right? Our complaints that come in, they tend to be one-offs about specific individuals. What you wanna do is increasingly improve policies and practices so that integrity, honesty, that's what is always the easiest path to follow. And so this team is already working hand in hand, in hand with the systems to take a look at particular issues like purchase cards and ensuring that our policies around those purchase cards are way they, where they need to be to make sure that folks aren't spending so much time filling out paperwork and we're being more proactive. And supply chain services under Aaron Henning has been a real key player uh, on this. And they're also serving a, as liaisons to develop necessary and accurate benchmark measures for internal and external stakeholders. And that's the work that they've traditionally done. So we're expanding that focus. The critical next steps, which I wanna highlight for you, is we're working on completing our first OIG budget um, that will fund this staff. Uh, the GM, uh, who I've stressed, right? Marty's been a clear and consistent partner on this, has uh, authorized the hire of 35 staff. This is gonna put us in line with other peer oversight agencies uh, that do the kind of work that we do for complex large agencies like the LADWP. Sergio, when you when you get to this yes. uh, next milestone, I would like uh, to review how you, you establish a baseline and um, how you uh, come to this need, just to understand it better. Um, I have no doubt that, that you will do whatever is prudent, but it sounds like a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 $5 million is, is not a cheap investment. Um, and I am, I, I don't like the word rate payer because it makes me feel like I don't, as part- it's Customer, everyone it, should right, be using customer. Every, everybody's a customer, right? Um, and everybody in Los Angeles is in essence an owner of the LADWP. So I'm as concerned about making sure that we're making wise use of these resources as possible. 35 staff is not an overreach given the fact that we have 12,000 staff at the LADWP as a whole and the contracts, the issues that pop up are complex. Um, but I've been clear with everybody that this is gonna be calibrated, which is if we find that we don't need this, we'll shrink back. If we need more, we'll be clear about that and we'll, we'll lead with facts. And I welcome the opportunity once that budget is, is finally settled to come back to the board and walk, um, walk the commission through what fed into that. Um, in the first quarter of next year, we're hoping to have completed hiring of initial frontline staff for our complaints and outreach and investigations and audit teams. Those folks are gonna need training, so we'll initiate training to make sure that they are um, where they need to be to handle the work that's headed down the pipeline. With the great work of the IT department and um, uh, the communications folks, um, we are working on uh, developing both our intranet internal website and internet external facing websites to allow for complaint submission through online web forms. Um, we've already reserved and everybody already uh, always laughs at me when I, when, I, when I mention this. We've already reserved our toll free hotline number which folks can call where we won't track their phone numbers. Um, 1-833-OIG-4-DWP so that it's easy to remember. There'll also be an internal short code so folks can call up. Uh, and we're gonna continue hiring with a focus on investigators and forensic auditors at that point. Um, at the direction of the board, uh, we are carrying out a review of the use of overtime by the Security Services Division. Uh, we're looking at five years of overtime there. And we anticipate filing that as a public report with a presentation in January of 2023. 
So, um, Inspector General, let me just understand the timing of all yes. this. So you said your first one is complete the budget. So that means that the $5 million has already been approved in this year's fiscal budget. Is that what you're saying? The positions themselves, uh, Vice President Ruiz, have been approved with the, uh, with the help of... Um, of the general manager. Uh, the other necessary budgetary items in a formal budget um, is what we're working on now. So you have 35 I, budget authorities now to hire. Yeah, if I could just clarify. So um, before Sergio got here, we took a stab at what we thought staffing would look like um, and, uh, and what the needs would be uh, and created a, a, a budget. So this is the first time that he's taken possession of, of that himself. Um, in terms of positions, we had a number of positions allocated. I, I always have some positions in reserve because needs change during the year. So I've you know, given him some additional positions to fill. Part of that being that some of the work that was identified, uh, such as that long time for resolving complaints and investigations, where those were being sent was just not getting done. And, and it was just added work for people who already had other work going on. And so it was clear during during this, that Sergio said, I need to have my own, my own crew that can do this and do it objectively. So that was something that was different than what we had imagined early on going in, including some of the corporate performance work and some of the other things. So, um, you know, through his digging into this, we gave him a skeleton idea of the office. He has since evolved it and developed it into this based on looking at the real needs and said, this is what we need to be staffed at to, to do it correctly. Understanding that a lot of this work sort of fell into other buckets before, but a lot of it was not getting done. And that's why we see the, 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 the delays and such that we've seen historically. Okay, that makes sense now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, and thank you so much. Um, I do want to give on the budget front a special shout out uh, to the staff who are currently helping create the, the OIG's budget. Um, Natalie Strobel, Charlotte Lee, Gabriela Ortega, and Brian Gibson have been uh, key players in helping get that off the ground, as has uh, the support staff within the general manager's office and uh, the HR team, uh, Michael D'Andrea and Maribel Gomez and the folks who uh, who support them. Uh, the, the LADWP is a special place with special processes and getting my sea legs has been a, a real journey and they've been incredibly helpful on that. Um, uh, and I wanna stress this again, senior management, the staff up and down the chain have been nothing but warm uh, and direct about their opinions of, of, uh, of what we're doing here and that the, the work is, is all the better for it. Anything else? No, uh, I look forward to um, continuously reporting to the board about the work of my office and I welcome you all to reach out at any point if you've got any questions or concerns. I welcome any questions at this point and I really do look forward to um, to working with you to ensure that we can allow the fine, honest work that happens at this agency every single day to take center stage. And that is the key. I'll, I'm gonna sound like a broken record on that. Um, LADWP is a critical agency with a lot of amazing talent, a lot of folks that have given years and years to the agency. And in many ways, they're per personal and professional pride are tied in with the institutional health of the LADWP. I think that what we are going to build here, the Office of the Inspector General, is going to ensure that um, we have less unwelcome surprises um, and, and a more proactive approach to maintaining that reputation where it should be. Thank you. Very well said, Sergio. Thank you for all your efforts, I think. Um, the community, the broader LA, um, the board all appreciate what you're doing. Uh, and, and you can tell that there's receptivity throughout LADWP. And so we're excited for you, uh, this next chapter of the, the company. Is that, is that <clears throat> some kind of a God that's speaking to us over there? <laughs> I'll give the the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you. I, I agree with everything Nicole has said. I really appreciate it. Um, incredible hard work and incredible progress in a short period of time. When did you join us? I joined in May of 2022, and I do want to stress it, it really does take a village. Um, senior management has been incredibly supportive of this. Um, and the folks who've been willing to reach out to me directly and my staff, um, both within the LADWP and outside of the building, 
have been key, um, and I hope that that continues. I have an open door policy I'll talk. Uh, sometimes to their regret to whoever makes the mistake of talking to me in an mm -hmm. elevator in a, in a hallway. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that that continues because the title can inspire all sorts of consternation. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned this before, especially given the recent history at this agency. Um, and I think that when all is said and done, when the dust settles, people will see the inspector general both myself and, and future inspector generals as a key partner in making sure that we can get the necessary work of the agency done mm -hmm. uh, in an efficient and honest fashion. Well, thank you very much for that very informative presentation. That concludes item number H. I'm gonna go back to item number B, which is our opening remarks by our commission president and turn it over to President McLean Hill. <laughs> um, I. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to uh, hmm. I think I'm going to pass on my opening remarks for this board meeting, except to say that uh, I very much appreciate the work of this board, the work of this team. Um, I particularly appreciate the work of our new inspector general. And um, while I was not present, I, because of the great technology, was able to see the presentation <laughs> outside of the room. Um, it is a uh, difficult time in the city of LA today. Um, and uh, It is a particularly dif difficult time for people who have spent their careers in public service, whether in elective office or otherwise. Uh, at this moment, uh, what we can do is to continue to strive for, to look for, to commit ourselves to the most hopeful future. Uh, that we envision for the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I said I wasn't gonna say much, but let me just, uh, let me make this comment. Uh, a, uh, just a few days ago, last week, in celebration of Filipino history, uh, I attended an event representing the department on behalf, uh, uh, representing, a de representing the department that was organized by our former vice president, Susanna Reyes, and others. Uh, lovely event on the steps of City Hall. And I was so inspired by all of the speakers that when it got to me, I actually was able to move without notes, like I'm doing today. <laughs> and uh, I opened by saying I love this city that I absolutely love Los Angeles, reminding people that I was born here. And uh, both my children were born here, one by design, as I boarded a plane a week before her birth to make sure that I would be in Los Angeles and not Washington, D.C., so she would be second generation. And I pointed out that what I loved about the city was what was happening that evening on the city hall steps. The gathering of the diverse communities that make up the lifeblood of LA. This is a place where we routinely celebrate each other, where we try to lift up our authentic selves and to make room for everyone else in their authenticity. That's who we strive to be. That's who we are. Even when we fall short, even when people we know that we've had relationship with, that we respect, fall short. Um, so uh, as we, at this agency, one that continues to be the pillar of what makes Los Angeles work. As we ride out these difficult waters and the turmoil created by that most unfortunate
tape. Let's just take a moment to remember who we are, that this city is what we make it, that we own our flaws, and that we will continue to reach for our better angels. Uh, so with that, I am going to uh, move to our next item. Uh, actually, you know what? Our vice chair has been doing such a great job that I'm going to let her. Uh, I'm being asked to uh, take a break uh, so that our technology folks can work on whatever the feedback issue is. Um, so we will uh, do that at this time. Uh, uh, council, is there anything that we need to do as we move into recess? The board will move into recess and um, we'll return when there is a quorum uh, upon a few moments' notice. Okay, thank you so much. We're recessed.
Test one, two, test. Because he's the Secretary of Natural Resources. Yeah. 
We just uh, you know, discussed with us, you know, some of those resource agencies. Is it all be a little bit more flexible? Yeah, it'd be nice if they understood what all we're trying to achieve and the timing that might help. Are we all good? Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's already at two. Testing the microphone, so okay. Yeah. Jasper. Yes, I know. Cool. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Marty. So.
It's ready. Yeah. Oh, it's from D. It's a DWP it's one. It's a DWP. I asked if we could get iPads. Yeah. Really cool. I get this one. Right. Uh, Better. Are we done with the feedback? I, I believe so. Okay, and if not, can't we do the meeting without the mics? I know we won't be on YouTube, but we're not legally required to be on YouTube. Correct. I can talk loud enough. I'm starting to. I don't mind not idea. having the mics. I think, I think it'll be okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. The, the vendor told me it'll be okay until tomorrow morning. Okay, fine. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Please maintain silence. <laughs> oh, but there are only two of us. Sorry, there's three. Oh, there. Now there's three. <laughs> Madam President, we're recording. Uh, terrific. Would you please call the roll? Commissioner Larrer? Present. President McLean Hill? Present. Commissioner Neiman Brady? Vice President Ruiz? Present. Three commissioners present and a quorum? Uh, terrific. We have, um, we're now on item. I, items recommended for approval. Um, there are no, I, well, first let's say items M10 and M6 have been deferred. Um, there are no items called special. So um, is there a motion to approve items M1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 11, and 12. So moved. A second. Second. Oh, would you please call the vote? Commissioner Larrere? Yes. President McLean Hill? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Three ayes motion adopted. Terrific. Um, We'll go to uh, filed items. Are there any questions or comments rel relative to filed items? Nope. Then we will move on to um, minutes. Minutes. Move approval of the minutes for September 27th. Second. Commissioner Larrere? Aye. President McLean Hill? Aye. Vice President Ruiz? Aye. Three eyes motion adopted. Terrific. Then we will move now to uh, management reports, beginning with J1. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, for our strategic long-term resource plan, I'd like to introduce Mr. James Barner. He's our assistant director for resource planning, development, and programs. Yes, good morning, commissioners. Um, 
Yeah, I'd like to just uh, say that this, this strategic plan is really a power system plan and it involves all the divisions uh, within power system as well as external organizations like FSO and Energy Efficiency Solutions. Um, this is a living document and it'll be updated every year as we have done from 2010 through 2017. And we took a three year break uh, to complete the LA 100 study, and now we're getting back on track with an annual update of the SLTRP. And you can think of this as a compass with a roadmap pointing us in the right direction, uh, but we can certainly course correct over time to adapt to changing technologies, state and city policies, resource availability and costs, and ultimately our customers' willingness to support and pay for this transform transformation that we're gonna talk about. Um, this is arguably the, the most transparent plan in the nation. Um, the, the rate layer diagram that you're going to see in this plan is uh, a clear example of this transparency that no other utility that I know of has ever produced. And the level in, of engagement with major stakeholders and the public is really unprecedented here at LADWP uh, for this, this uh, 2022 uh, SLTRP. And we have heard offline from uh, groups that we don't necessarily agree with everything that we do, that it is uh, the most transparent collaborative process that they've been involved in. Um, I'd like to sincerely thank the advisory group members who devoted their valuable time to attend 11 two-hour meetings over the last year. Uh, many of these same members invested a few years uh, of their time to solicit feedback uh, into the LA100 study. Um, and voluntarily came back to be part of this process. I'd also like to thank public relations staff and their consultant for their expert assistance in preparing the team for the advisory group meetings and the public outreach meetings and presentations. And uh, a sincere gratitude to the team here, the IRP team led by Jay Lynn here, uh, who's the manager of resource planning uh, and leading this effort. Um, and so I'd like to turn it over to Jay Lim. Good morning, commissioners. It's an honor to be here. Um, and today we'll be giving a presentation on the 2022 Power Strategic Long-Term Resource Plan. So quick overview of the agenda. So we'll be uh, giving, prefacing the presentation with the LA100 study and then get into what is the Power SLTRP We'll also discuss community engagement and the case scenarios that were developed with feedback from the advisory group, and also go over key metrics that we evaluate from the, for the SLTRP, which includes uh, the role of local generation, emissions and air quality, reliability and rate impacts and, and build impacts. And then lastly, we'll touch on uh, risk and challenges. So first we wanna get into an overview of the LA100 study, which is really the genesis of our uh, 2022 SLTRP. Uh, as, as the board knows, uh, the, SL, the LA100 study was a multi-year study that we partnered with the National Renewable Energy Blair? Lab. If you leave the room, we lose the quorum. Sorry. Um, am I good to continue? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, so LA100 study, we partnered with the National Renewable Lab for a period of three years, and NREL, with the help of LADWP, evaluated nine different scenarios to determine uh, what are the investment pathways needed to get to 100% renewable by 2045 or earlier. And so NREL also evaluated uh, what would be the investments and potential benefits to environment and health and how that would impact local jobs and the economy, as well as how communities can shape environmental justice. And so the LA100 study was complete March of 2021, and it determined that 100% renewable energy was achievable. Uh, one of the key findings was also that for reliability and resiliency, combustion turbines that were powered by renewably derived fuel such as green hydrogen would be necessary. Another key takeaway was that 
uh, building and transportation electrification were the key, was key to affordability as it increased our, our revenue to support fixed cost. Also, uh, transportation electrification would have the largest impact on reducing local uh, pollution, such as nitric oxides within the LA basin. Uh, LA 100 study uh, came up with a cost of about 57 billion to 87 billion. And this would be in addition to existing obligations, such as the power system reliability program. It also determined that significant jobs would result from our clean energy transformation, about 9,500 jobs. And last, across all nine scenarios, there were common investments across all pathways to get to 100% clean power. So uh, building on the LA 100 study, the department has developed the SLTRP and in the interim, we have determined uh, initial uh, critical steps. And these critical steps, we've made tremendous strides to date. Uh, they're, they're outlined here in these five categories, at least 80% renewable by 2030. This is 20% above the state law. Accelerating transmission to support that. Uh, this is key to, in, to be able to import our uh, renewable energy. Um, we, we have 10 critical transmission lines, two of which are already in the permitting process. We'll so also be- So can you just stop there really quickly? Sure. Um, I'm curious, um, you said accelerating the trans those two transmission lines. Um, exactly what does that mean? During the permitting process, we expect we've moved up the dates from when to when. Uh, so, so this is driven by um, the mayor's directive in 2019 when the mayor announced that we'll abandon plans to repower. So that really put uh, a motion forth to bring forward our transmission plan so that we can maintain reliability as those once through cooling units uh, retire. So in, in the analysis, we've determined at least 10 critical transmission projects uh, must be done to solve the once through cooling retirements. And two of them are currently in the permitting phase, two out of the 10. Um, in total, we have about 34 uh, transmission projects by 2030 that needs to be completed. I didn't hear an answer to the question. Yeah, but you said these two are currently in permitting. So by when? Oh, I'm sorry, um, by 2029, which is the once through cooling milestone. Um, they, they, of the 10, they all have different uh, milestones, but the, all of them are by 2029, uh, all of the 10, and two of them are in permitting pro process. Uh, the two lines uh, listed here, um, we can circle back with you on the exact milestones, uh, but I know they are before 2029. Okay. Um, and then um, also, also uh, transforming local generation, um, integrating resource uh, energy storage and deploying distributed energy resource programs. Uh, the, these critical next steps uh, was presented to the board about a year and a half ago and also to uh, city council. Um, the key takeaway is that there are common investments across all the LA 100 scenarios and we're taking these initial steps and have made uh, tremendous progress. And so uh, building on that, we next segue to the 2022 SLTRP. Uh, as James mentioned, uh, in 2017, our SLTRP process was paused uh, so that we could incorporate the LA 100 study. Uh, since then, uh, Senate Bill 100 was passed into law, which required 60% renewable by 2030 and 100% clean energy by 2045 based on sales. Uh, the year after 2019, the mayor accelerated our clean energy targets by releasing the clean, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, which put a milestone of 80% renewable by 2036, and also committed the department to abandon once through cooling. Uh, and 2020, we uh, went move forward with LA 100 study. Uh, 2021, after LA 100 study was complete, uh, our mayor and our city council. Uh, set forth a motion to put into a plan, uh, which is SLTRP to 100% clean energy by 2035. And, and this year, we are looking to finalize the, the roadmap that will give us near-term actions and uh, actionable plan to achieve this 100% clean energy by 2035. 
And so as we develop our 2022 SLTRP, uh, we have certain guiding principles as part of our process. Uh, these are the three pillars. I like to think of it as a three-legged stool. Uh, all three uh, legs <laughs> must be balanced in order for the stool to stand. Uh, the first one is environmental benefits and equity. So th these are metrics like uh, carbon emissions, uh, nitric oxide emissions, uh, local air quality. Uh, this year we've added equity, which is a consideration looking at uh, where the power plants are located and how that impacts uh, local communities. And in the blue, we, we also seek to balance reliability and resiliency. Uh, this was a, a key outcome of the LA 100 study. Uh, traditionally, reliability was uh, the major consideration, but now that we've seen um, recent events like wildfires, we've added the resiliency as a new metric. And then in the orange, we also seek to balance affordability and rate impacts. And so with all of these three uh, planning pillars, in um, in balance, we consider these in, in the development of the recommended case. Recommended case, um, which we'll go over the scenarios for SLTRP, ultimately guides our near-term actions and our, our future energy planning. Uh, so th this slide here is actually taken from the LA 100 study and it represents uh, all of the common investments across all scenarios. So these are minimum amounts of resource builds by 2045. Uh, w today, we have about 10,800 uh, total megawatts of jointly owned and department owned generating capacity. By 2045, we'll be more than doubling that. As you can see by the sheer amount of megawatts, it's, we have to add on at least 15,000 additional megawatts. And these are in diverse uh, areas of technology. Uh, we'll be rapidly expanding renewable energy, uh, both on the bulk and local power side, along with energy storage to support it. Um, also, heavily, heavy investments on low customer solar, en uh, energy efficiency, and electrification with flexible load. And to support that, we'll also be expanding transmission and distribution. And uh, in order to maintain resiliency, uh, we also are transforming our local generation to renewably fueled dispatchable turbines in the par amount of uh, 2,600 megawatts. And so as we look at our the design of our power system, we have four local power plants, three of which are coastal, located by, by the coast that you use once through cooling. By 2030, about half of our in-basin generating capacity will, will retire uh, because of once through cooling regulations. and. Um, and uh, one of the key takeaways from LA 100 study is that uh, we, we will have to transform our in-basin generation to a fuel that is renewably derived uh, in order to reach the 100% carbon free uh, by 2035. And all scenarios across the LA 100 study um, maintains in-basin generating capacity in all of the power plants in order to reach, uh, to uh, maintain this amount of reliability. And so uh, next we want to shift gears to highlight the community engagement that we've had throughout our one year process. Uh, the SLTRP advisory group is really the cornerstone of our process uh, where we've had um, 11 total meetings over the last year, which um, launched uh, September of last year. Uh, this is actually double the amount of meetings that we've had in prior processes. Uh, for example, the 2017. We've also doubled the amount of stakeholders um, and uh, after the LA 100 study was complete, we maintained the LA 100 advisory group, uh, which brings our stakeholder count to, uh, to 45, over 45 different stakeholders. In the past, we've had between 20 to 30. And over the course of the one year process, uh, we've had many presentations, totaling over 25 different presentations uh, to get the uh, advisory group up to speed and also to uh, solicit feedback and engagement from the group. Uh, we recently com completed our public outreach process with three virtual meetings, late August and September. Um, and in addition to this, we've also had dozens of related meetings. So these are ad hoc meetings that we had with uh, environmental groups, with neighborhood councils and different stakeholders. And so as part of what we heard from our advisory group, um, that this was instrumental you know, as we developed our case scenarios to uh, evaluate the different metrics. Uh, one of the key areas of feedback that we heard is uh, stakeholders were concerned about 
in basin uh, green hydrogen combustion. And so we uh, evaluated a sensitivity that would include um, green hydrogen fuel cells in lieu of green hydrogen combustion. And we presented that to the advisory group. We also uh, heard that stakeholders had a uh, uh, had high interest in incorporating more long duration energy storage as a way to limit uh, in-basin combustion. And so we, we've actually presented, and uh, we brought NREL on board to present um, their uh, no combustion, uh, no in-basin combustion scenario as part of the LA100 study. And then also we've um, included long duration energy storage in our plans and um, have developed the framework for to evaluate emerging technologies. Uh, as there was also concerns about local air quality and health impacts, we've, as uh, part of our process, we continue to partner with NREL uh, to have them evaluate the air quality uh, impacts um, by on a source level, so looking at it locationally and then translating that to health impacts. Uh, that analysis uh, is ongoing and it will be incorporated into this year and next year's SLTRP. There was also uh, discussions with uh, equity and how um, that was a priority for SLTRP. And so we continue to track, uh, closely track the LA100 equity strategies. And as recommendations come out of that study, uh, which is slated for May of next year, we'll be fully incorporating that into our future SLTRP processes. So based on the, on the feedback from the advisory group, what have we actually changed? Uh, so part of... Um, our process, um, so th this year's, we've actually added a lot more scenarios compared to the last year's. Uh, so um, based off of the feedback, uh, we've looked at a, a, a wide list of different sensitivities. For example, the no in-basin combustion, uh, that was something that was very computationally intensive that we had, uh, that we added. We also looked at low load sensitivities, high load sensitivities. Um, and um, a, a list of others, like what if scenarios, as we call them. Uh, this is in addition to the price sensitivities that we typically look at. So what we call these what if sensi sensitivities, these are um, new for this year's SLTRP. And then- Right, so I just wanna make sure that when we have an advisory group and we're asking these people to volunteer their time, that we are incorporating what they're telling us into our planning. Uh, yes, uh, we, we are, and as part of our process, we also document all the meeting minutes, uh, which is posted on our website. And um, in our SLTRB document, we'll be synthesizing those, going through all of those, and summarizing them into key area of themes. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so, so, uh, so uh, towards the latter end of the process, uh, latter part of the process, we then conducted public outreach meetings. Uh, these were recently completed, late August and early September, and we also captured some of the key areas of feedback. Um, overwhelmingly, we heard um, a concern about rates and energy burden, and so uh, this was the most common area of feedback where uh, a lot of the public had concerns about the forecasted rate increase, uh, and they wanted the department to be transparent on the cost. And as, as James mentioned earlier, uh, today we'll be presenting the rate layer diagram, uh, which we worked closely with financial services on to really detail what are the rate drivers. Uh, we also heard set more secondary concerns about hydrogen and emissions, which we continue to evaluate. Um, part of uh, future SLTRPs will continue to uh, evaluate emerging technologies as they develop and incorporate that into our process. Uh, clean energy policy. Uh, was also a key area of uh, feedback where we heard that there were concerns to maintain reliability um, in the event of wildfires, droughts, and heat waves and challenges. And so part of next year's SLTRP process, we'll also uh, be looking at the impacts of climate change and how that could, will impact our resources. We also had uh, feedback on customer resources. That was a um, key area of interest where customers wanted to participate in the clean energy transition. And so uh, we, we develop our scenarios with um, local resources in mind where we have um, a tremendous amount of, of diverse resources to meet the clean energy pathways. And as the LA100 equity strategies uh, study becomes finalized, we'll be further incorporating outcomes of that into our process. So next we wanna shift gears uh, to talk about the, the case overview 
of our SLTRP, which is really scenarios on how we can achieve the 100% clean energy targets and some of the results. So these uh, cases were developed with input from the advisory group. Um, because of the city council motion, uh, we have to develop a scenario that achieves 100% carbon free by 2035. So these represent cases one, two, and three. Um, in the gray is uh, the, the reference case, uh, Senate Bill 100. This represents the current state law, which is 60% renewable by 2030 and 100% clean energy by 2045. Um, based off of retail sales. So, so K, uh, SB 100 allows for natural gas as backup. Uh, cases one, two, and three uh, does not allow for natural gas beyond 2035. And, it, and we've developed these cases to limit the use of hydrogen where uh, these will be primarily used as backup. Um, case one, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, cases one, two, and three all achieve 100% carbon free by 2035. Um, the difference between case one and two and three is that case one uh, achieves 80% renewable by 2030, whereas case two and three achieves an accelerated 90%. And so case two um, it, with 90% puts a focus on uh, bulk power resources where transmission projects is the, most, is the highest. Uh, compared to case three, case three has a higher focus on distributed energy resources. So what we seek to do is evaluate the, the trade-offs between these three cases uh, and we re and the reference relative to the reference case, which is SB 100. And so these color codings will be consistent with the subsequent slides in which we will compare the different metrics that we evaluate. So the first metric is the clean energy targets. Uh, re RPS or renewable portfolio standard. Uh, as we look at, uh, at cases one, two, and three, uh, we can see the differences here, 80% uh, for case one and then 90% for case two and three. So this represents a, a ramp up that's more accelerated. Uh, and this is all relative to the state law, which is 60%. By 2035, we can see that all cases achieve 100% clean energy by 2035. And so uh, as we develop these scenarios, we also incorporate key takeaways from the LA 100 study. Of the nine scenarios the LA 100 study evaluated, only the early and no biofuel scenario achieves the clean energy target of 100% clean um, by 2035. So we're building on um, key takeaways from LA 100 study. So basically all the scenarios that we are considering are exceeding the um, legal mandates, is uh, that Yes, correct? exactly. 10 years ahead um, and more restrictive with, uh, with no natural gas. In case one is the state legal mandate, right? right? So that's kind of like the baseline and then we have all our case scenarios that exceed that. Right. Yes, exactly. Uh, so and, and next we, we look at uh, build rates. So these are the amount of clean energy resources in um, terms of megawatts that we have to build uh, from today through 2035 and then also through 2045. Uh, a snapshot of our historical build rates in 2018, from 2018 through 2021, we have we had an average build rate of about 200 megawatts per year. So this represents both utility and customer sided clean energy resources, resources like wind, solar, geothermal. Um, and when we look at our uh, cases one, two, and three, this is almost four to five times the fold in terms of amount of megawatts per year. Cases one, two, and three requires that we build over a thousand megawatts per year, every year until 2035. After 2035, the build rate is then relaxed a bit because we've accelerated our clean energy targets. Uh, when we compare this to the state law, it's almost double. And so th this represents a, a massive transformation as in, in terms of the amount of builds that we have to, uh, um, in order to reach our clean energy targets. Could you back up? It says it does not include additional system infrastructure nor additional human resources that are required to address existing backlogs. Can you just tell me what that means? Uh, sure. So um, these are the amount of clean energy resources like wind, solar, energy storage. Um, the sub there are supporting resources that um, are not in this chart. Uh, so this includes like transmission upgrades, distribution upgrades, um, human resources to support all of these builds. 
Um, we will be incorporating them into the SLTRP, but for the purpose of this chart, um, they're not quantified in the megawatts. And when are they, when will they be incorporated? Uh, so this year we, we have um, the IHRP or integrated human resource plan that's moving in parallel. And as that um, plan becomes available, we'll, we'll incorporate this year. Uh, if it doesn't meet the milestone, definitely next year. And I, I think that plan was presented to the board um, in earlier this year. Yeah, we weren't close to getting yeah. there. So I, I ask this question every single time because there's planning and then there's what can be executed. And setting ourselves up for, um, you know, we're setting everyone up for huge disappointment because we keep talking in the abstract in ways that are very detailed and well thought out about what the plan is. But over here, the resources needed to execute that plan continue to lag and we're not having much conversation about that. And when we do, every single time it says we are way behind, it's not there. We I keep trying to understand how and when this comes together. So yeah. I'm going to ask that question again. How and when does this yeah. come together? And I think we're going to do a, an update on that plan next next board meeting. So when I say how and when does this come together, I'm not really talking about how and when does this come together in terms of a presentation. I'm actually talking about how and when do the resources necessary to execute the plan materialize? That's my question. And I don't think that will be next week. No, <laughs> it won't be, it won't, they won't materialize next week for certain. But, and, and the large part will be the challenge of getting the right kind of people in some of the areas for the infrastructure work, which is the line, the line series particularly. And but there's it's progress way more there. than line series. It is more than that. It's yes. way more than that. So, I mean, we can't keep having this conversation about something that's supposed to happen 2035 and not be able to articulate how we execute this. Yeah, I think that's the, the big piece is in the IHRP is really identifying exactly what we're going to need. I mean, we're already pushing forward on a path on hiring and, and going into those resources. Um, but to where those two actually come together, I think that's exactly what we're looking at in our IHRP is to identify exactly where we need to be so we can bring it up to that point. Okay, but yeah. this is 2022. Yeah. And, you know, just sitting here for a few years, there are things that are readily apparent a hiring anybody or hiring people in a way that beats attrition or assembling just the hiring side is a significant challenge that I don't know that we that there is no evidence that we've overcome the competition for people is also something we have to confront. Um, the resources, as in money to support this, is a challenge. And then there's just, you know, forget the human resources side. There's the time it takes to do the work. There's the planning for the work. There's any contracting that has to be. So I'm just, it's difficult to continue to have this, this conversation in the context of beautiful slides and feasi plans that really relate to feasibility studies. Yeah. Um, disconnected from the real nitty gritty of how we execute this. And we've got to be able to be far more definitive about that not just what it takes to execute it, but how. Because I know how to buy a mega mansion. <laughs> I know how to do it. I don't suspect that I will be capable of executing that anytime soon.
so that's really the conversation that, that they, the piece of this that I'm looking to see this department engage in a way that um, reflects the kind of information that everybody who's looking at this actually needs. I'm sorry. I agree, because 2035 is tomorrow yeah. in city time. Any time. Okay, so, uh, so next we t look at a different perspective in terms of uh, total power uh, resources. Uh, so these represents new additions in, in on top of what we have today. As I mentioned, our total generating capacity is, is about 10,800 megawatts. And so by 2035, we will need to more than double what we have t uh, currently with in order to reach the 100% clean energy targets. So cases of one, two, and three, they all exceed 12,000 megawatts of bulk power resources. So these include um, utility scale renewables, utility scale uh, energy storage, and basin hydrogen projects. Um, case three has the most bulk power builds. Um, by 2045, uh, as we saw in the previous chart, the builds is um, more relaxed between uh, over the last 10 years. And so um, overall, they, all, they achieve um, more than 16,000. Uh, when you compare this to the SB100 reference case, all um, case one, two, and three are all more than double uh, the state law. And so um, we shift gears into looking at the distributed energy resources uh, breakdown. So these are total additions to what we have today that are needed for the, our clean energy transformation. Cases one, two, and three, uh, they all exceed 2,600 megawatts of DERs or distributed energy resources by 2035. Much like you uh, said how much we have on the prior slide, how much do we have now of DERs? Um, I, I, I have to get back to you. Okay. We have about 600 megawatts. 600. Yeah. Just, and probably another 30 megawatts of behind the meter uh, battery. Okay, thanks. Um, so for the DERs, I do want to emphasize that these take time to build out because they're customer-driven resources. They, they require customer adoption. So that's why we see through 2045, um, they continue to increase, um, as, whereas when we looked at the bulk power side, it, it was a little bit different. So these are uh, resources like distributed solar, distributed energy resources, demand response. Uh, so they all, uh, case three, I want to highlight that it, it has the most uh, distributed energy resources relative to case one and case two. Uh, another metric that we evaluate uh, is cost. Uh, so this is represented by net present value cost. Uh, so in, in order to uh, evaluate the cost, we run a production cost model, uh, which we uh, consulted with Ascend Analytics, and, and they uh, ran hourly dispatch models from today through 2045. And taking the cash flows and bringing that over to net present value, um, the chart on the right shows uh, the total amount of uh, cost that it would take if we were to invest in the in building the clean energy uh, future today. So it, for the state law, it's a 60 billion from today through 2045. Uh, cases one, two, and three are um, marginally higher, 74 billion for case one, uh, 78 billion for case two, and 81 billion for case three. Uh, these include both fixed costs, so these are like capital costs for our, um, our borrowed projects, um, also power purchase agreements, uh, as well as variable costs, variable costs to operate the power system, which includes fuel, emissions, uh, and operation and maintenance. Wait, wait. <laughs> uh, 74 billion. Uh, how, how do we afford that? Uh, I'm looking at you, this is, our, this is just information <laughs> gathering about comparing each one, so we don't have a plan yet as to how we would finance this, but it's just looking at the different scenarios and saying what would those estimated costs be. And when we get to the rate impacts, we assume our current rate structure uh, for recovering these costs. That may change in the future as well. And uh, is this all assuming PPAs? It looks like not project ownership? Uh, it includes both. So um, we have both capital and PPAs. Okay. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out what the cap, 
what is our current, I mean, this is a very loose question, Anne, but our current debt capacity uh, ability to add on the power side? We're about 65% out of the 68% of our capitalization ratio. So we would look at PPAs and other things, as well as that Inflation Reduction Act to see if there's any um, tax credits that we could get to offset costs. Okay. And um, what do you need, Anne, to... Um, put together a plan around any one of these cases? We actually need real specifics. So as we go into the financial part of it, you'll see that we asked each of the project managers, transmission, what they needed, uh, PSRP distribution, what you needed, hiring, what you needed, and everybody gave us a high dollar amount, but we didn't take that and put it into specific actionable steps. So maybe within the PSRP dollars, there may be some staffing assumed and that's also covered in the uh, AIHRP. So we'll need more real specific plan as to how we get here once a, once a, you know, a uh, case is selected or case is recommended, how would we get there in, in a more detailed workable plan? A little bit of chicken egg problem there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, please. <clears throat> Uh, the next metric that we evaluate as part of our process is reliability. Uh, and we, we look at this in terms of resource adequacy. Um, the, the amount of resources to serve our load all hours of the, the year. And, and so the um, North American Electricity Reliability Council has a one in 10 day standard, which is uh, one day out of 10 years, uh, we can shed load. Uh, so that equates to 2.4 hours uh, per year. And so as we look at the year 2035, uh, we see that the SB100 case uh, achieves that 2.4 loss of load hours per year, uh, which is the industry standard. Uh, cases one, two, and three are actually uh, more reliable in terms of resource adequacy. So this assumes all lines are in, um, all transmission lines are in, and it achieves in the ballpark of 0 0.5 loss of load hours. Uh, we also- Is there any sir? conceivable way that all transmission lines, I mean, is there any conceivable way that we will have achieved this, you know, plan of having these 10 transmission lines upgraded and moving <laughs> by 2035? So we do recognize um, the, act, the actual implementation of those lines is a key area of risk. Uh, so something that we're actively um, looking at uh, as part of our the biweekly implementation meetings to track those. Um, in terms of the modeling, we're, we are evaluating uh, the resource adequacy uh, with all scheduled lines that are in, um, but we also factored in resiliency as part of this year's process, looking at, uh, which will be covered in a later slide, but looking at a, a recent wildfire such as the Saddle Ridge fire. In the event that we do lose transmission lines, we have to have sufficient in basin generating capacity to get through that event. Uh, so, so all cases were developed to be reliable in, in that aspect. I'm sorry, I think it's me, but I didn't, and I'm having a little off day today, but I didn't understand the answer. Can you repeat that? Um, so the, to clarify your, your question is regards to um, what if the 10 transmission lines are not completed? Uh, so we've ran um, a what if sensitivity on some of the more critical transmission lines. Um, and with the outcome of that it, we, that was presented to the advisory group is that if those transmission lines were not, com are not, were not complete by certain dates, we will have to rely on our, more on our in-basin generation to make up the difference. Yeah, I know. And, and I think, you know, we know that it is impossible, right? I mean, that to have all of those lines done by the date that we're assuming in this analysis, right? I mean, it's just inconceivable. Only yeah. two are in permitting. You're talking about, it's, usually it's mm -hmm. like 10 lines that you're talking about. Two are in permitting. It's inconceivable that this will occur. So I keep trying to understand why we are assuming things that are just not possible yeah. and using that as you know, 
why haven't the baseline we moved? assumption? Yeah, it's a base assumption. I don't, I don't yeah. understand that. Um, I, I would say we, we are developing this SLTRP in response to the city council motion. And the city council motion had set forward um, a goal of 100% carbon free by 2035. If we have some flexibility uh, to incorporate risk and challenges to uh, where those goals can be flexible, then that, that could perhaps uh, um, address those concerns. But uh, th this is really a power plan that we are uh, developing to in response to the city council motion. And um, it is iterative as we will refine and optimize this over time, year over year. But this is a starting point to where we want to get to and we have uh, these projects in place, uh, these projects planned in order to get to that goal. So can I, can I make a clarifying question? Yes. So it seems like, it, is it fair to say this is more aspirational mm -hmm. than, That's what I'm hearing. Um, and I don't want to put, Marty and uh, Brian, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth here, uh, but I, I just want to make sure we're, we got the right level set, because mm -hmm. so feel free to, to yeah, because we're not in. the city council, so we have a whole different standard that we've got to deal with as it relates to this. At least for me, reality becomes really important. Mm -hmm. um, and if this, if what we're doing is we are designing to and talking to what you know has been laid out as a goal, but we don't have to take it seriously. I mean. And I hate to say it that way, yeah. but that kind of is what I'm trying to understand. Yeah. I want to know the truth. There's a lot of assumptions you know, based on this plan and how we're going to move forward with this, right? And, and their goal here specifically was to, is it possible? And this is how it's possible. Right? So looking at what we have to do, yes, there's a lot of transmission projects that are completely reliant on this. And that's a huge challenge for us. The hiring process, right, and our, our staffing plan is a huge challenge for us, right? And it is, it's assumed that that'll be able to be, be done. Um, how we're going to pay for it um, is essentially a huge challenge for us also. And all of these things are running as studies running in parallel. Um, this one's specific to, very specifically, is it possible and how can we get there? Uh, and that's what this presentation is for. There is some huge challenges, yeah. And, and I think and that, that was just to name a few. And, and, and I'm not, so what I'd like to, for us to consider as we continue to walk down this road, um, there are you know, people who are deeply committed to achieving these goals. Mm -hmm. And you know, I don't, I'm not intending to throw cold water on them. Mm -hmm. I do believe it is critical that the path be spelled out so that to the extent there are choices to be made and there is there are decisions to be made, there is advocacy to take place, that people understand where they need to lean in because we don't control much of this. Mm -hmm. We can say whatever we want about what would be nice to have, do, et cetera, but we don't control it. We don't control the permitting. We don't have exclusive control over our hiring. We don't have control over our rate structure. There are any number of things we don't control. And if we don't get, like, if we're not, don't provide clarity around not just what the assumptions are, but what would have to change in order to make those assumptions remotely possible, then we're just selling folks, a, you know, they're going to, you know, think they've got victory because <laughs> we said, well, we can do this only to crash into a very, you know, cold reality some years down the road, not too many years down the road when it all falls apart because we can't make it happen. And that is my big concern about how we are engaging these processes. Uh, Dr. Pickle. Um, 14 slides on from this. Uh, there uh, is a presentation, or it's three slides on the radium packs. Uh, when uh, Jay is done, uh, I'll have four or five minutes of comments on that and the fundamentals behind this. It will, uh, and 
uh, we will have a more detailed analysis of those rate projections at the next meeting, available at the next meeting or uh, any follow up meeting you want to, you'd like to have it discussed at. And I appreciate that piece of it, but, and, and this is no reflection on you, Jay, you're doing a great job, but it's just, to me, it's, that's what I'm thinking in my mind. How realistic is this? I mean, these are great options, but what, like I said earlier, you know, 2035 is tomorrow. And so what's realistic for us to be able to accomplish? And maybe later on in your presentation, you talk about some of the challenges. But for me, I like I like the truth. And not that I'm not saying you're not telling the truth, but I'm like, there, I need the reality of what's possible and what's not possible. Or like um, President McLean Hill said, it, or otherwise it's just aspirational. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I think... Uh, probably the modality here of presenting some incredible work that you and other members of the organization have been working hard on for a while. Um, could have been some study sessions in between that might have incorporated some of us as part of the process as opposed to sort of seeing a very thoughtfully put together but dense, dense presentation which brings up some issues. So, you know, it's it just is a way of sort of absorbing information and um, being able to to make um, productive comments is, I think, what we're hearing. Um, one point of clarification: the city council motion has is a tagline comment uh, and do this at uh, minimal impact on rates. Mm -hmm. This does not have a minimal impact on rates. Mm -hmm. No, and, I, and again, we it's one thing to have, you know, press conferences and to speak in sound bites about all the, you know, all the wonderful things that we're going to do by a certain date. Mm -hmm. um, and there's you know, no shade around that. But in this room, we've got to be mindful of, you know, the reality mm -hmm. around it, or to Commissioner Neiman Brady's comments, you know, we've got to be clear that this is, you know, this is, this is what's possible in the in a world where everything is perfect and we don't have to worry about pesky little things like money or people or, you know, Permits. or regulation, <laughs> all those other things that, you know, form the reality of doing it. You know, this is what's possible if there were magic. And, you know, I believe in magic, I do. I, you know, I, I understand that people can change all sorts of things, but there's nothing that suggests to me, looking at this, that I've got anything left to do except wait for us to execute. I just want to make, it, make sure that it's clear that we can't execute. So um, that's, a, that's a tough uh, sentiment for him to respond to, so let me just add one thing. Um, I think, you know, when you are putting together goals that we have in front of us, they they take a whole bunch of time and resources, and clearly all of you have weighed in tremendously to, to get us to the stage that we're at. And we have to start somewhere with knowing with what is the art of the possible. Um, I think what everyone on, well, everyone of the commissioners is essentially saying is, we, we want to know sooner what is needed to make the possible a reality. And what do you need from us to do that in all the different segments and how we get to that next stage. And I, I, more presentations is probably not gonna get us there. We probably need some sort of working group that uh, is dedicated towards specific areas, whether it's financing or personnel uh, to literally address the, these topics. Because um, what is missing from this presentation is really the, the ask, the what is needed, or, and um, that's where I think we're all drawing the conclusions from. So perhaps, Marty, the next step from at least my perspective, and, and Cynthia, I don't want to undercut what you were, the direction you were going in, but um, I, I would like to see 
what areas, just areas, we need to dedicate time to sort the actionability of all these different elements out. So the transmission lines, how we get from two to 10, how um, the, the personnel, the community pieces, um, and obviously the resources are gonna be a tremendous ask. But um, I wanna see where all the pain points are and, and then I think we can start to figure out how we can assist in tackling them. Yeah, we know that you know. I mean, I know having talked to a bunch of you that you know. <laughs> so we have to start addressing those things, both internally and externally. And I, and I just wanna say this is no reflection on you, Jay. This is an excellent presentation. Uh, I've seen the presentation before and it's great, but I just, for me, from my vantage point, it's like, okay, we know the why, how, how, how does all this happen? because it, it doesn't happen overnight. But I just want, you know, I don't want you to feel disrespected at all because it's not a reflection of your work. It's just me sitting here thinking, okay, now how do we, what's the, what are the next steps and how do we make all this happen? No, 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 those are great points. Thank you, commissioners. Brian, did you have something you wanted to add? Uh, no, I just, you know, you were saying, you know, you want, you're looking for the why. And I was like, this is the what, right? This is this is the what we need to do to get there, right? And I think we're running parallel paths where we have studies going on in all of these different challenging areas. Um, and we're only bringing forth that one piece of this, and that's the that's the plan, the what to get there. Um, so there's tons of why that's going that is coming in our human resource plan, um, and what our rate uh, plan is going to be. Um, so I, I think what you're really looking for is to bring that all together sooner, right? And so they're all together and we can bring you up to date on the progress so far. Um, and I think well, that- I think the key word, uh, uh, and again, I will you know, defer to Commissioner Neiman Brady was actionable. Right. Because we see plans all the time, <laughs> but we really do have to distinguish between what the plan is to achieve X and then what is actually actionable so that we can, and again, from my perspective, it is so that we can get clear about what needs to be done if what is currently actionable doesn't get us far enough and there are things that need to happen outside of our control that needs to get put back into the plates, into the court of those folks who control it. Um, so that, you know, they built a stadium overnight. You can build transition, <laughs> transmission <laughs> if you want to, <laughs> right? If you want to, but we don't control that, and we need to start making that plainer, clearer to everyone, all of the stakeholders who are invested in this work. I think if it might help to back up and for me to make a few comments Sir. that speak to this. Um, First, uh, there were several things in the NREL LA 100 study that were said quietly, mm -hmm. uh, too quietly to have the impact they should have. Um, first is uh, on the economics. The challenge with going with a 2035 goal is you're doing everything with the technology you have today at the price you have today. And we're expecting technology progress in these areas over the next five to 25 years, where uh, effectiveness like are, is likely to be better and cost is likely to be lower. Uh, we've certainly seen that in the cost of solar. Um, a problem with jumping ahead and using current technology at current cost is we're committing to these costs for the life of the equipment and LA will be paying for that over the next 20 years. The second thing that was said quietly in the LA 100 is if you selected the LA 100 scenario that uh, went to 23, uh, achieved 100% goal in 2035, um, it was shown to decrease jobs, not construction jobs, but jobs in the economy uh, because of the, inc uh, the cost impact on half of our load that is commercial and industrial. And this is buried inside the report, the net impact of construction jobs and uh, jobs lost in the economy was negative in the 2035 case. 
So uh, those are two cautions on going forward with a 2035 path. Um, and there were some things that were left out of the NREL study. There were the cost of enhancing the distribution system. They assume it would be all set and ready to go. Uh, but we're still working, we're not where we need to be in terms of a distribution system enhancements uh, to be ready for a launch into post 2030. Um, and then I think more important, let's return to the fundamentals. And Mr. Brewer, I may need my picture in a minute. Um, <laughs> we want to be leaders in addressing climate change. Mm -hmm. But to be a leader, you have to have followers. And uh, to do that, you need to have equal or better reliability and to do it at a cost that's attractive to others. Tripling the rates, which is implied in later in these charts, um, is not likely to encourage anyone. That's tripling rates, assuming two and a half percent inflation. We're looking at a CO2 chart. Uh, 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 Jay's chart is chart 38. If you, okay. but I think we're being I don't, I don't, presented I don't on have, side. I don't want. You'd have to jump around, but okay. the 2035 prices are a tripling in nominal dollars. <laughs> if you look at purchasing power dollars, uh, scenarios one, two, and three are all in the range of a doubling in real terms. SB 100 is an increase of about a third in purchasing power terms. Um, so <clears throat> if we can go back to my slide, Reggie. Um, <laughs> These are annual CO2 emissions uh, over time. Uh, the U.S. and, the Euro and Europe, uh, the U.S., uh, if we add in Canada, that's 400 million b people, uh, and world population is going to pass 8 billion in the next couple of months. Uh, U.S. and Canada are 5% of the world population. Uh, our carbon emissions, even if we're decreasing them rapidly, uh, won't amount to an effective decrease in carbon in the world. To have an effective degree, decrease in carbon and to be leaders, uh, we have to be able to do this in a way that's cost-effectively attractive. And we're f fighting against uh, improvements in the economies of China, uh, India, and, e and the rest of Asia uh, that have carbon growth that's way faster than anything for scale uh, we have 20 uh, it, we've gone from over 18 million tons of carbon a day to uh, once we get past IPA uh, four to five million all these numbers are in billions not millions so um, we, we really have to do this consciously to do it more cheaply and rushing for 2035 is unlikely to be achievable or attractive to others. Okay. Um, thank you. Appreciate that, sir. Uh, so next, I <clears throat> wanted to shift gears on the, our, the role of our in-basin generating station as we decarbonize. Uh, so this chart, as many of you are familiar with, is from the LA-100 study. And uh, related to what Mr. Pickle mentioned, Dr. Pickle, is uh, our LADWP emissions is really a, a sliver of the e economic-wide uh, emissions. So we, we look at NOx emissions uh, looking at a 2012 baseline. Uh, this is taken from LA 100 study. Our emissions are shown in the red. Um, the other bars on the right are 2045 emissions, uh, forecasted emissions from the LA 100 study. Uh, so the key takeaway here is that between the difference between the, the, the M and the H, which is moderate versus high load driven by electrification, uh, is that 
Electrification is really the key driver for uh, decreasing emissions and uh, improving air quality. And so um, we can also see that in 2045, the, the relative difference between SB100, a 2045 scenario, versus early and no biofuels, a 2035 scenario, is that power plant emissions uh, represent a very small uh, impact relative to other sectors. But we do have the ability, uh, the opportunity to decarbonize other sectors, such as transportation and buildings, by providing that clean electricity fuel. Um, and um, we want to compare today's usage of our in-basin power plants uh, to a forecasted usage in 2035. Uh, as we build out our renewables with energy storage, we expect the usage of our power plants to dramatically shift from today through 2045. Uh, this is actual data from 2021, where we see on average our in-basin generation accounts for a usage of 20 to 25%. Uh, by 2035, when we have a system that's fully built out uh, in terms of clean energy, um, the usage will shift from daily to uh, infrequent and primarily for backup with a, about 1% capacity factor. Um, and we do see that the firm generation in basin provides resiliency uh, to help support the development of new transmission. And then uh, as we translate this to the impacts on NOx emissions, uh, which is a criteria pollutant, pollutant that it, uh, affects um, air quality, um, Based on the LA100 study, um, power plants, uh, LADDP owned power plants represent 0.4% of sector wide emissions. Uh, and over the long term, by 2035, we expect to reduce our emissions um, by about 97%. So, what this means is by 2035, uh, we can expect our in basin generation to be used primarily for backup and emergency purposes and pr uh, contribute about a hundredth of a percent. Uh, and so all three cases that we evaluated uh, with 100% carbon free by 2035 have uh, relatively similar uh, in-basin NOx um, outcomes. And so as we look at why are we looking at green hydrogen, um, based on the LA100 study, uh, the LA100 study determined that there was a need to maintain in-basin firm uh, dispatchable capacity for long periods of time uh, this re uh, represents consecutive days to consecutive weeks uh, where there's often times where uh, you have consecutive days of low renewable production, such as in the winter with cloudy weather uh, or high peak days. And so during these times, about 1% of the, the time where we would need dispatchable firm capacity. And uh, LA100 looked at different options. It looked at uh, biofuels, green hydrogen, and uh, the cleanest option was green hydrogen. So we are cautiously optimistic about green hydrogen, and uh, we, we see that there's a benefit um, with the Inflation Reduction Act that we can benefit in terms of uh, money allocated for green hydrogen that would push forward that industry. And so um, as we developed our SLTRP scenarios, we looked at a more recent wildfire, the Saddle Ridge fire that occurred in 2019, and we um, developed all scenarios to be uh, robust enough to ride through that event. And so this in this event, uh, we lost major transmission arteries for a period of about 22 hours where we had to rely on our in-basin generation. Um, and uh, through, uh, uh, in, with in-basin energy storage, uh, it typically cannot supply this need because uh, the discharge is between two to four hours. And so we do need long duration uh, generating capacity. And one of the key takeaways from the LA100 study is that to maintain reliability and, and resiliency even in the decarbonized power system, uh, we have to maintain firm capacity in basin. And so uh, next we, we evaluate uh, local air uh, emissions and air quality and uh, from today uh, into the future. Uh, as on a high level, um, this is a snapshot of um, emissions inventory based off of California Air Resources Board data in 2019. As you can see, electricity uh, in state and imports represent about 14% of statewide uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, the bulk of the emissions is from transportation, industrial, and buildings. Uh, so we do have a unique opportunity uh, to decarbonize other sectors. And 
Uh, and so this chart represents our forecasted emissions uh, for CO2 in our SLTRP. Uh, the three cases are the colored cases where the gray is the, the reference SB100 case. Uh, so I wanna highlight here that our baseline was 1990, about 7.9 million metric tons. And the, the state goal, uh, Assembly Bill 32, uh, calls for uh, reducing statewide emissions to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. So we are already well ahead, ahead of that um, at uh, about 8 million metric tons. Um, the long-term goal of Assembly Bill 32 is to reduce um, statewide emissions to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. And we, we see based off um, on the mission trajectory, we would get there at about 2026. And so we have an accelerated goal uh, relative to the state, uh, especially with uh, uh, the uh, increase um, in renewables and um, clean energy resources. Uh, we also heard uh, f feedback from our stakeholders that uh, local air quality was a concern. And so we are continuing to partner with NREL to evaluate uh, NOx emissions and how that impacts air quality, health, and um, different metrics that will be incorporated into the SLTRP. And so we have uh, preliminary results where NREL has completed phase, uh, almost completed phase one of their study out of two phases. And they, they uh, re-evaluated the emissions inventory for uh, our SLTRP scenarios relative to other, other sectors. So, so on this chart, I wanna highlight the, the, the difference in scale between the top and the bottom chart. Uh, the top chart has a scale about uh, 16,000, where the bottom is 18. And where LADWP's SLTRP falls in is in the bottom bar charts. You can see SLTRP case one, case two, and case three. Uh, these NOx emissions are about 10% uh, compared to the uh, LA early and no biofuels high scenario and marginally less uh, compared to all the other sectors. Uh, so it, it, at a high level, our power uh, system emissions um, by 2045 will be approximately uh, one out of 23,000 out of the total emissions. And so uh, when we put this in context to scale relative to other sectors, uh, one out of 23,000 is equivalent to uh, one grain of rice out of 2.6 cups of rice. Uh, so next, we, uh, as uh, Fred mentioned about the rate and bill impacts, we wanna get into what that means uh, for our SLTRP scenarios. So uh, we've been working closely with our financial services organization, um, providing them uh, data on our resources and uh, this is the latest that, uh, in terms of the rate comparison that we received back from financial services. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I do want to caveat that this is, uh, was completed before the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. And so we're looking forward to incorporating um, impacts of the Inflation Reduction Act and how that can put a downward pressure on rates uh, and it will be included as part of next year's SLTRP. So as we look at the reference case, it represents a uh, average average uh, rate increase year over year of 4.8%. Uh, as a sense of reference, our last rate action was from 2015 through 2020. And that was an approved uh, average rate increase of 4.9%. So SB100, the reference case is on par with that. Uh, cases one, two, and three are uh, much higher at ab about 7.7% for case one and two. Um, and case three at 8.4%. And so we'll, we'll be looking forward to the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, infrastructure law and how that would impact our costs as part of uh, next year's SLTRP. Uh, one thing, uh, so this is shown in cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so we wanna translate that to what that means for our customers. Uh, in terms of our customers, you can see the th three different cases, one, two, and three, compared to uh, relative to the SB100 and how uh, we can expect uh, rates to, uh, our monthly bills to increase over time. So the bar chart um, on the, the first two is showing a, a typical apartment that uses 300 kilowatt hours per month uh, in 2022 versus 2035. And then the single family home represents approximately 700 kilowatt hours per month. Per month. And you can uh, take a look at um, the last two bar charts, how 2022 compares to 
2025 for the cases one, two, and three relative to SB 100. Uh, one thing that has not been included here is energy burden. That's something we're taking a look uh, closely uh, to see how customers can also save from energy efficiency and electrification um, by switching over to uh, electricity relative to um, uh, paying for gas. So the, sorry, that bill is exclusively then a power? Uh, yes, this is only electricity, assuming uh, average usage per month. Okay, thanks. So uh, this chart here uh, is a little bit busy, but it, it breaks down all of the rate drivers that are contributing to uh, forecasted rate increase. Uh, the red line here represents the total uh, rate forecast. Uh, th this was what was shown when we showed the comparisons. Uh, and this is, uh, we picked out one case. This is case one to, as an illustration. Uh, we, we can see the, uh, consistent with the past SLTRPs, uh, energy efficiency and power system reliability program are the largest contributors for uh, rate increases. Uh, this was consistent as part of the 2017 SLTRP. Uh, energy efficiency, for example, uh, by 2035, we have a target of 4,200 gigawatt hours and it represents um, about 7.3 cents per kilowatt uh, hour increase for, to the rates. So um, that this is driven by incentives and lost revenue. Uh, so we, we see that electrification, uh, at the very top you see a dotted gray line. Um, this actually puts a downward pressure on rates because with all the electric vehicle um, additional sales from charging EVs, uh, it increases our total revenue and uh, spreads out the fixed costs. And so as part of our, um, our next uh, rate action, um, we will be, uh, th this will be a separate process that follows the SLTRP. And um, it, uh, there will also be uh, extensive public outreach as part of that process. And uh, here is a example of the ener energy burden uh, in with regards to um, electrification. So we can see as an example, a customer that typically drives a gas sedan spends about $18 per 100 miles of driving range. Uh, compared to electricity, it's about $12 savings. So we're looking forward to incorporate some of these findings into the SLTRP. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about the Inflation Reduction Act, um, these are uh, items that we're closely evaluating and um, breaking this down. Some of this will come from future guidance from the IRS, but some of the, of the items that we identified as possible downward pressure on rates includes the 30% investment tax credits for solar, PV, and energy storage. Uh, and also electric vehicles, um, there was a tax credit that was passed for both used and new EVs that could potentially increase our load that would put uh, downward pressure on rates and also provisions for energy efficiency and equitable access. Uh, these are, are uh, we're currently evaluating and inco will incorporate into next year's SLTRP. And so we're looking forward uh, to optimizing the next SLTRP and looking at how we can vet out um, implementation, uh, how we can vet out uh, optimizations to increase um, the, uh, optimize our resources. Uh, so uh, some of the considerations, we continue to balance uh, rates and uh, equity along with uh, looking at opportunities for external funding, such as partnerships with the Department of Energy and looking at um, clean energy alternatives and emerging technologies. And so uh, as we mentioned, there are uh, lots of rates, uh, risk and challenges as it relates to our plans. Uh, th this is a, a first shot at developing a uh, resource plan uh, that will guide our near-term actions. But over time, we will also have to develop processes uh, on how we can um, evaluate these more thoroughly. So these are things we're currently uh, looking to build into our process. Uh, this, will, our, uh, this year's SLTRP will include an initial framework uh, that we can build on over time. So looking at some, some examples include um, evaluating emerging technologies and how, um, at what point do we incorporate those technologies into the, our resource plan, uh, integrated human resource plan, incorporating the outcomes of that, also vetting through implementation and constructability, uh, evaluating the impacts of supply chain assessments and procurement risk, uh, operation, uh, operation and maintenance, 
uh, climate change, geopolitical conflicts, and cybersecurity threats. And so now uh, we'd like to uh, talk about the next step. Uh, to, as part of reviewing the city council motion and to be responsive to council motion file 210352, uh, this was a directive that was set uh, last year, September 1st, 2021, that instructed the SLTRP to achieve 100% by carbon free by 2035. Uh, and it also had uh, uh, a list of other um, items to be responsive to. But one of the, the three um, priorities that we typically evaluate as part of SLTRP uh, are shown in the colored boxes, a minimal adverse impact on our customers. Um, so this is something we have to be cognizant about in terms of affordability, uh, also to prioritize environment and equity, and um, last to maintain reliability and resiliency. So as we look to balance these three core pillar, planning pillars among the three case scenarios, uh, we've um, had briefings with our executive management, uh, division directors, uh, um, AGMs, GMs, and uh, case three has the highest rate impact. So we now take a look at case one and case two uh, with the implementation challenges of case two, where case two has 90% um, by 2030 uh, over case one, which is 80% renewable by 2030. Uh, there, it requires um, more resource builds as long as, as well as uh, more importantly, um, a highest pr pressure on transmission projects. So not only are those 34 projects that are underway uh, needed, but it potentially could trigger uh, even more transmission projects and more corridors. So with that in mind, um, we want to, uh, with our uh, brief, uh, while briefing our executive management, we are recommending case one uh, at, to be responsive to the uh, city council motion as it has a moderate impact on transmission, it achieves the 80% um, renewable portfolio standard that is 20% above the state law and ultimately 100% carbon free by 2035. Uh, and so as part of the next steps, uh, we, the, the resource planning team um, is, uh, is working uh, very hard on um, drafting the SLTRP document and we'll be releasing that shortly. Um, after that, we'll be finalizing and approving the SLTRP. Um, uh, after, uh, and then next, we'll be conducting lessons learned to prepare for future SLTRPs. Uh, next year will be an important year because once every five years, uh, we need to submit the integrated resource plan to the California Energy Commission. Um, and so that will be due by the end of next year, and we'll be basing that off of this year's SLTRP. Um, and then on, in parallel, uh, financial services will be conducting a rate analysis. Um, and so any future rate action will uh, require board approval and city council approval uh, with uh, stakeholder engagement and all stakeholders. Uh, I wanna uh, also briefly uh, take some a bit of time to thank my team, uh, which um, are here today in person. We have uh, David Castro, um, Robert Hodel, he's a uh, virtual, uh, uh, Luis Martinez, Makun Nair, and Vanessa Gonzalez. Uh, they put a lot of effort into this process, so I, I want to express my gratitude to them. Can I ask you a, a, a basic question? Who, who put the presentation together? Uh, it was um, the the whole team actually contributed to the slide. It's one of the better ones uh, oh, that we've seen, so that's really thank very you. well done. But uh, special thanks to David Castro for helping coordinate everything. The uh, power system continues to outdo itself when it comes to the thoughtful um, and complete, uh, you know, and also uh, both engaging uh, and informative presentations. You know, so even those that are long and complex are just incredibly well done and easy to access. And we all appreciate that. Thank you. DWP has brought forward substantial improvements in their planning process over the decade that I've been reviewing these. Uh, and they continue to improve the process. Uh, they didn't, it would have been another five minutes in the presentation, but they also looked at the uncertainties in sales. Uh, 
given uncertainties about how fast EVs are gonna be implemented, uncertainties about how fast electrification might occur. Um, Which is a critical risk, right? Because criti so critical risk, the and, and they, they presented that on in one that of the piece. AG meetings, but they didn't add it here, but it, that was an important step in their analysis as well. That's part, well, one of the risk assessments that's important. Uh, thank you. Are there questions or comments uh, beyond those which we have peppered <laughs> our presenter with throughout the presentation? No, if I could add, I guess I think your point was well taken. This, this is the exercise in answering what we need to do to get there. Now the questions become, can we afford it? Are there roadblocks in the way that, that we can't find ways around? And, and what are the exact steps to make to make these happen and, and how do we actually push it with boots on the ground. So I think that is that is the outstanding question. This this answered the what do we need to do and what do we think it's gonna cost. And and now the harder work of actually making it happen begins. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you, Commission. Yes. to adjourn into closed session at this juncture. Um, it is one o'clock. Um, I know that we can have lunch in closed session and bring our lunches in. So why don't we take a, a 10 minute break and then move into close, uh, begin closed session. The board shall recess into closed session for a conference with legal counsel regarding the items listed on the agenda. After the closed session, the board will publicly <coughs> report any action taken in closed session and the vote or abstention thereon of every member present in accordance with California Government Code, Section 54957.1. Thank you. Thank you.